Peace be to this house. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church and School. Um, just a few announcements tonight. You'll note that uh, it talks about a confirmation in the bulletin. That's for tomorrow. I don't know that the time is noted on that. Um, so that'll be uh, tomorrow morning at 9. Um, and by the way, um, somebody's going to have to tell me, is tomorrow the day where if you don't do your clocks right, you're going to be late to everything? Okay, yeah. So that... so. Do make sure that your clocks are right and everything like that. <laughs> yeah, spring ahead. Yeah, that's the. I better be on time. Nadine says, and she's absolutely right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Big day tomorrow with adult confirmations. So, and we're privileged and blessed that that's happening. Uh, five, five adults. Uh, well, four adults and one freshman in high school, uh, which you know, young adult, I guess. So that 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 means something. Um, the other thing that's worth noting. Uh, well, there's quite a few things. Let me, let me get the one that I, I make sure I don't forget. Pastor Lemke's here. Um, you, you, many of you surely remember Pastor Lemke from when he served, um, what was it? You said like four years ago or something yeah. like that. It would have been about four years ago. Um, so we're grateful he's here to preach God's word to us tonight. And the occasion is this 140th anniversary of ours as a congregation. Um, and, and we're just having a, a string of guest pastors come preach. Pastors that have served in the past at Trinity or like sons of the congregation that became pastors. So Pastor Lemke, having served in the past, we're, we're so grateful and thankful that you're, you're here tonight um, and tomorrow as well. Um, there is a voters meeting scheduled for um, March 17th. After the service at 10:30 a.m. in the church basement, and this this has to do with um, uh, considering to issue a call to um, the uh, for for uh, for a presented candidate for uh, Trinity Lutheran School. Uh, Mr. Greg Johnson is his name. You can see something of a little uh, biography of his printed. It's this little uh, insert here in in your bulletin. Take a look at that. Um, and, uh, and do, do consider attending um, that, that meeting coming up. Um, so what, it'll be in the bulletin this week and also next week. So we have to, we have to announce it twice. Um, but that'll, that'll just kind of land us uh, as, get, get us as quickly as we can ready to, to issue a call if indeed uh, the voters make that uh, decision to do so, having, having uh, considered this candidate, Mr. Johnson. Um, and he was here to visit, by the way, I don't, uh, maybe you knew this, but uh, he was here to visit last, this last weekend, I, I want to say it was. Or maybe the weekend before that. My brain's a little bit fried with the time having a newborn in the house, so uh, bear with me with that. <laughs> okay, I think, other than that, um, we will have a children's message. Pastor Lipke prepared something. Um, I'll let him kind of set that up. Notice that there, there aren't, like, young children here, but we're all children that, of the Heavenly Father, so... Um, he will he will do that uh, anyways all right I think unless there's somebody that has something in particular to mention I'll take a moment for that okay then let's greet one another and share the peace of Christ
please turn in your hymnal to page 184 for Divine Service Setting 3. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the intro it that is found printed in your bulletin. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We be to the Father. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent is from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now join together in confessing our precious Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. When asked what we believe, we confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All of the children may be seated. Um, can anybody tell me what an artist does? Don't everybody ask there at once because it gets so noisy. They can paint pictures, so if we saw a picture, we know that there was an artist who painted it. Is there anything else that an artist may do? Make music. So uh, when we are blessed with the special music, uh, organist, pianist today, uh, that's a work of art. Okay? What's that? Yes, yeah, sculptures. Oh, speaking of sculptures. Just happened to have one here. Isn't this beautiful? This was given to my wife and I uh, by my congregation in Dow City a lot of years ago. But I always loved it because it, we remind us the little children should come to the Lord, right? But anyway, obviously when we have something like this, we could call that a work of art, okay? Well, in, in the epistle lesson for today, did you catch it uh, in that 10th verse? Remember when the Apostle Paul says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he hath prepared in advance for us to do. We are his workmanship. So that means that you and I are what? We are works of art. You ever thought of yourself like that? Works of art. But what's the difference between you as a work of art or me or this? What's the difference? <laughs> that's not alive, right. We're alive, aren't we? We can talk, uh, we can see, we can hear, all of those things. Uh, we can walk around. We're alive. So we would have to describe ourselves as living works of art, right? So what's the significance of that? If you think about it, how did you become a living work of art, art of art, to, for God. You know when it started? Okay, I can kind of buy that, but I think there's a better place. He said at conception, because we are all made in, by God, right? He's, he's given us that ability and gift to do that. But I was thinking of something else. Thank you, yes. Now, your answer is right, it's okay. Baptism, yes, because there God's Holy Spirit comes into us. Faith is created in our hearts, okay? And he says, we are his workmanship. What are we supposed to do? He says, what did he say in that? Uh, to do good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to do. So, what kind of good works can we, works of art, do? What do you think? What are some things that we can do to show that we are God's work of art? Share the word. Thank you. So important that we do that as God's people. Uh, he's called us to do that, to go, hasn't he? Talk about it a little more later. Yes, that's what we are to do. Share the word. What else? If I were talking to children, what would I be asking them to do? What, would, what are some of the works that a child can do? And you can do them too, but what do you think? And I'll give you a hint. Think about the Ten Commandments. Huh? If you think about the Ten Commandments, what are some things that a child or that I as an adult can do which is a work of art in God's eyes from God? Oh, for, uh, obey your parents. Listen to your parents, okay? So if you still have your parents here, okay, we don't have, well, we got a couple younger ones here. Okay, obey your parents, okay? Love one another, huh? Something these called us to do. Love our neighbor as ourselves. All of these different things that God has called us to do and to be as his works of art. To think what a blessing that is that God has called each one of us to be his child and an heir of heaven. And of course, uh, the one gift, what's the greatest gift that God has given to you? I mean, I know a good Sunday school answer would be a little louder. A uh, little louder. All right, okay. That's work. Okay, yes. The greatest gift he's given us is Jesus, but I'm thinking of that baptismal gift. The faith which trusts in Jesus, right? 
And I love the earlier, verse 8 says, By grace are you saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. So we don't do these works that God has called us to do. We don't obey the commandments of God in order to, get, to gain favor from God. Why do we do them? Yes, thank you, love. We love, everybody, because he first loved us. That's the gift of the gospel that God has given to us. Uh, to be his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Let's pray, shall we? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of faith. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Now we pray that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit, that as we have been called to be your works of art, that you will empower us to faithfully serve you, to follow you, and be directed by your word. Uh, what a gift you have given to us. So bless us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you, children. You were great. You can return to your seats. Okay. I believe we go to the next hymn, right? Okay. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together with you uh, before your word. Open our hearts to receive your calling. Empower us with your Holy Spirit to leave this place as renewed children of God, desiring to serve you with all that we are and have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, and again, before I start, I, I thank you uh, for the privilege and the joy uh, of standing before you again. I enjoyed my time here, and what a blessing it is uh, to be with you again uh, during this year-long uh, anniversary celebration. My dear friends, fellow redeemed saints of the living God, folks were fussing and griping. They were angry, and they were upset. And what is typically the result with those kind of situations is the people began to criticize, and soon the words became heated. The angry words spoken were like painful barbed darts intended to hurt and to wound. And the outcome again was predictable. There was offense given and offense taken. People were supposed to be close, like a brother and sister in Christ, but suddenly they felt uncomfortable. 
in each other's presence. Does that sound familiar to you? I may have had a specific situation in mind uh, when I wrote those words uh, with this description. But you know, the more I thought about it, uh, the more this drama is nothing new. It's lived out, I believe, regularly in our lives. This short account, I think, could be the description of many of our personal interactions with family, with friends, with co-workers, yes, even with brothers and sisters in Christ. The fact of the matter is that conflict and disagreement with others is really a common thread in the fabric of humanity. Griping and complaining are the symptoms of a much deeper problem, the problem of sin that confronts each and every one of us. The Old Testament lesson uh, for this evening speaks of a gripe session of a similar sort. The Israelites were wandering around in the, in the desert. You all know why they were wandering, don't you? God had brought them right to the doorstep, right to the front door of the promised land, and they were afraid to go in. They didn't trust God's leading. They had been led right to that border and they just wouldn't make the next step. They didn't believe that God would give them the land that he had originally promised to them. And so while wandering in the wilderness, they did just what us human beings are, that we tend to do. They began to fuss, they began to fume, and they began to complain. The only problem, of course, for them, they picked the wrong guy, <laughs> right, uh, to complain against. Uh, listen, let's read about it. They, re they travel from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. That's their complaint to God. The sin of the Israelites very clearly was what? To criticize God. They failed to trust in God, in his love, and in his care. They forgot the miracles that God performed in order for them to get out of Egypt in the first place. In short, they were so focused on themselves and what they thought was best that they began to grumble and speak against God and against God's leader, Moses. And the consequences of their actions came almost immediately. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Now the implication, I think, of what it says there is that the bite of these fiery serpents was very painful in the first place, and it also caused many of them to die. Well, I think it seems pretty clear, doesn't it, that maybe the Lord was trying to send them a message to let them think about what they had done and what they were doing. He wanted to show them that their rebellion was causing them to suffer these bites in the first place. They, many of them were going to an early grave because of their lack of trust in God. And so what we heard in the story also, in the midst of all of this, what happened? In the midst of their agony, they recognized their sin and they came to God. We have sin. They made a confession of their sins. Take the fiery serpents from among us. And God did it. God did just what they asked. But the way he did it, at least to me, seems a little odd, doesn't it, when you think about it? He said, make a serpent or a snake out of brass and put it on a pole. Elevate it, he said. That so that everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. The bites continued, but as soon as they were bitten, if they looked at the serpent on the pole, they were healed. They were taken care of. Well, let's make a couple of observations uh, about all of this. First of all, I think it's interesting that we notice that God didn't remove the serpents from the camp. There's no word that he did that at all. The consequences of sin remained for the Israelites. They were still bitten. 
they still felt the fiery poison. But what God did provide was a way of salvation from death. He allowed the Israelites who trusted in God to avoid perishing as a result of their rebellion and their sin. Some things never change. We live in a world world that continues to fuss and to gripe and complain. And because of that, life lived here in this sinful and fallen world is a difficult one as we face sin each and every day of our lives. But like the Israelites, God has provided for us a way out. And that's through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, fast forward 1,500 years. If you remember in the, in, in, uh, sorry, Jesus applied this well-known event to his own ministry, his own being lifted up on the cross. We read it, Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. There it is. Everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. That's why Jesus came into the world to become the real salvation, the real solution, the only solution to the sin problem. That's Jesus. To be raised between heaven and earth on a cross. And by dying in that way, he would draw all people to himself. And just like God promised salvation from death for those who looked at the bronze snake, he gives us the same promise. You just heard it. Everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. That's Jesus' promise, my friends. What a blessing and a gift he gives to us in that promise. We can, we can rest assured that heaven is ours because of Jesus. Now let's fast forward another 2,000 years or maybe 100, 1,884 years, to be more exact. Trinity Lutheran Church. I don't know if the church and school were founded and started at the same time. Anybody know? Yes, they were. They were. Okay, well, good. I got it right here. I just wasn't sure. Okay. So eight, 140 years ago, the church and the school were established in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and it was established for the same purpose, wasn't it? Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. You know, I thought about that as I drove in again. I, I love trees, but it's quite impressive when you walk, when you drive up First Avenue, is it First Avenue or Street? I don't remember. Anyway, coming up on that, and that church is all open now. You can see it. And there's that cross right up there. I just love that. I mean, I love the trees too, but boy, it sure stands out uh, in our city now. Uh, for 140 years, this congregation has faithfully carried out the commission that God has given to his church to go, to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that he's commanded us. And then he promises, lo, I will be with you always till the end of the age. Guess what? He has been. He will be. He is. And he will be. That's his promise to us as his people. Pastors have stood, well, maybe not at this pulpit, maybe across the street. But they've stood at the pulpit in the church, in Trinity Lutheran Church, faithfully doing what the Apostle Paul encouraged that young preacher, Timothy, to do. Remember when he said, preach the word. That's what he was called to do. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season to rebuke, re reprove, rebuke, and courage with great patience and careful instruction. That's been going on here. I was a small, very small part of that ministry carried out here in this congregation for 140 years. But I had that same privilege while I was here to do that same thing, to lift high the cross, to let people know about Jesus and what he has done for them. 
I think of the words of Paul again in Philippians when he talks about uh, that relationship he had with, with his disciple, with, with that congregation. He said, I thank God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of the partnership of the gospel, because of our partnership in the gospel. And I had fun here. <laughs> I loved my time here with you people. It was a joy to be God's servant, serving God's people in this place. And I thank God for that, for that partnership that yet continues today, even though I'm not here. It's a partnership we have with all of God's people uh, together. So God this evening has taken us er, from a snake on a pole to a savior on a cross. What a journey, what an incredible journey. Never, my friends, never shrink back away from the cross of Christ. You know, the Bible says in Romans, is it Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the message of the cross of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's what our God has given to us. You know, John Fisher in a book entitled uh, On a Hill Too Far Away tells of a church in old Greenwich, Connecticut. And there is a one-of-a-kind cross in that church. And it's not that the cross itself is overly unique. What's really strange is where the cross is located and positioned in the sanctuary. It's not where you would expect it to be, behind the altar or above the altar. It wasn't there. The cross on that church was bolted into the concrete floor right in the middle of the aisle. See, right there, jump, jump ball right there. That's where it would be, okay? Think about that, right in the middle of the, the, of the between the altar and the people. It was an obstruction. People, the pastor's words had to go through it. The people had to look at it wherever they were seated. They couldn't get, a, couldn't get away from it. It was an obstruction. It was a sturdy wooden cross, 10 feet tall, made of raw, untreated wood. And the word pretty would not be a very accurate description of it. You know, we're not used to that kind of a cross. Because I think in our world today, uh, it knows little about the cross and its significance in the lives of God's people. Too many churches today can easily fall into uh, that trap of, uh, of uh, user-friendly gospel, telling people only what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. It's important for us as the people of God, to always remember that in the middle of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the cross. It stands there, an instrument of execution, one on which our Savior showed his incredible love for us by hanging on that cross and dying in payment for our sins. You know, that bronze serpent raised reminded the wandering Israelites of the profound depth of their depravity, and at the same time, it reminded them of God's incredible mercy and God's love. And the cross, my friends, the cross does the same for us. Our sins were carried to the cross by Jesus, buried with him in the grave, and his resurrection, uh, his resurrection victory assures us, makes it absolutely certain where our eternal destiny lies. It's in heaven with our loving God and with Jesus Christ. May we always revel, my friends, in the cross of Christ, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It does show us our sin, but it shows us also our Savior, and it tells us what's in store for us. Salvation, eternal life with God. May we hold on to that cross until he calls us home. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen. I believe the congregation should rise and we join in the singing of the offertory.
seated for the offering. We continue with prayer. Please rise. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord God, draw us into your light. Expose wherever we, like your people of old, have thought, spoken, and acted against you, that in repentance we might look to your Son, lifted up on the cross, and be saved from your righteous wrath. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of hosts, you gave your only Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Bless the work of missionaries as they carry this gospel to the ends of the earth, that many may hear of your love in Christ and be saved through him. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you have set Joseph, our president, and Kim, our governor, as authorities over us according to your holy will. Bring these and all leaders of our nation, as well as our nation's citizens, to repentance and faith in your Son, who reigns over all things. Grant that we might be ruled wisely and in accord with your law, that our prayer might be answered, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you had Moses lift up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, thereby foreshadowing your own sons lifting up on the cross. Teach us to hear in the Old Testament the promises and pictures of the coming Christ, who is their Savior and ours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, you are our light and salvation. Hide in your shelter, Faye Allen's nephew, Joel, Daryl Axtell, Steve Bolster, Edna Bornstein and her son, Robin George, Judy Bush, Carmen D. Catlin, Elizabeth Cooper, Donna Cross, Eldred Gerhold, Julian Hammerlink, Kelsey LeCamp's father, Don Mater, Mike Robertson, Chris Roselle and her family, Bill, Paul, Ross, and Amanda, Sonia Schneekloff, Daniel Shaw, Kel Stellwagen, Michael Ty, Eloise Weiss, Doran Welch, Bobby Wilkinson's nephew, Steve, and the loved ones of John Elton's mother-in-law, Joy Ross, and all who suffer in body, mind, or soul. Keep them in their day of trouble from falling into faithless fear and uphold them with your peace in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, whose steadfast love endures forever, we lift up our voices in thanksgiving. You have redeemed us out of trouble and gathered us here to feed us that our souls may not faint within us. Satisfy the longing of our hearts with your son's good things, his body and blood that we may abide in your eternal peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, you have made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Cause your spirit to be at work in us, that we may not carry out the sinful desires of our body and minds, but be your workmanship in Christ Jesus, walking in the good works he has prepared for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Taught by our Lord, and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, grant us a steadfast faith in Jesus Christ, a cheerful hope in your mercy, and a sincere love for you and one another through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.